Hello and welcome to another episode of the Successful Garden Design Show. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at how you create a stunning roof terrace garden. And we're also going to have a tiny segment on travel, as I've been exploring some beautiful locations in southern Spain for ideas and inspiration. And I found a wonderful little village that's just full of sculptures and art that are just wonderful to so give you lots of inspiration for your garden. We're going to be looking at some of the design plans that we've been working on at Successful Garden Design, as well as revisiting a stunning little courtyard garden. If you're frustrated your garden doesn't look as beautiful as it could, even though you've purchased lots of lovely plants, then help is at hand. Plants are not enough. You have to have a good design layout. And when you combine design with the beauty of plants, that's when the magic really happens. It's our mission here at Successful Garden Design to show you how to do it. And it's much easier than you may think. I'm Rachel Matthews and I've been a professional international garden designer for over 25 years and I teach garden design online. So I'm back here at my favourite guest house in the Requin Valley, Casa Aeri. Now this garden may be very familiar to some of you because we filmed the pilot episodes of the Garden Design Show here back a few years ago. They have an absolutely stunning roof terrace garden and it's uh, somewhere that you can guarantee to find me relaxing whenever I stay here in the evening with a book as it's lovely and cool up there. Now, part of the main design that makes this garden work is what I want to talk you through. Now, we're also going to discuss the planting that they've used here. Now, there's something very particular that they have done with the planting. Now, can you work out what it is that makes this so successful? And I'll tell you in a moment. Now, one of the main things you have to take into account when designing a roof terrace garden is obviously how much weight that the garden can actually take all the structures beneath it. Now the walls of this particular house they're probably nearly a couple of foot thick so they're pretty chunky walls so um, where you can see the uh, bench that's been built in I think that's probably on top of one of the dividing walls in the house and whilst they're not quite as thick as the outside walls they're still pretty dense so they'll take a fair bit of weight and what that has enabled them to do is divide up the space nicely and create different areas and with all of the the plants that they've managed to pop in it really does feel a very lovely and secluded garden. So if you've got a roof terrace garden you've got to think about how you divide the space and also you need to be careful of which views you want to keep and which views you want to block with the planting and also how windy it gets. That's another factor with a roof terrace that tends to be more prominent than it is in a regular garden. So obviously choosing the right plants for any roof terrace is critical to success. But something else that I want you to notice that they've done here is that it's not all flowers. Look at the cycads in pots and those um, very defined architectural foliage is what's really making this garden come together. They provide a wonderful backdrop for all the flowers and the soft foliage of the oleander. It is always far too easy to get hung up on flowers, but you've got to think of form when you're doing any garden, but particularly in small space gardens, it's absolutely critical to have a good balance of form, texture, foliage to the flowers, because the flowering season, especially in the UK and cooler countries, is so much shorter than other places, so you cannot rely solely on flowers when you do any garden. So did you spot the clever planting trick that had been used here? Well, the thing that caught my eye, and this is a very difficult thing to do, it requires a lot of self-control, is to not use a million different varieties up here. It'd been very tempting to have put in a whole mix of plants, but amuriel has been very clever by keeping the color scheme very limited to sort of the pinks and blues and whites, and also the planting. She's repeated the oleanders, she's repeated the cycad, she's repeated the palms. And yes, there are sort of geraniums and different plants in there, but on the whole, she has kept that planting scheme really, really simple. And that repetition does actually make the space feel larger because you're seeing sort of um, a lot of things repeated around the garden. It just gives you that sense that, oh, their space is much larger because of the clarity. But uh, even as as a professional designer it does take a heck of a lot of self-control so well done Anne Muriel I'm very impressed with what you've achieved here 
And if you'd like some more top tips on how to add the wow factor to your garden, I've created a cheat sheet that you can download and a short video tutorial that walks you through the top five things that you must do if you want to create a stunning garden. So head on over to successfulgardendesign.com forward slash wow and you can download your cheat sheet there. Here's a catch up on what Ellie's been up to. Um, we've had quite an awkward shaped garden um, to design and she's been working up lots of our ideas and here's what she's come up with. So we always like to try out lots of different options to see which is going to be the best use of space and then we present the clients with the one or two that we feel are going to be right uh, once we've gone through our process and uh, sometimes we do a little colour one as well because that can help you see things. So the main thing you need to do when you've got an awkward shaped garden like this is to try and steer the eye away from the awkward angles. So on to our travel segment. Now it's a bit of a departure from what we normally do but as I spent most of June travelling around southern Spain I found some absolutely lovely places so I thought I would share them with you in case you're off on your travels. Now if you're heading into Gibraltar or anywhere up the coast and you fancy something a little bit different I strongly recommend going up into the mountains and this whole area is lovely. There's a very pretty place called Galsin and uh, if you want a lovely lunch Hotel Banaraba is absolutely wonderful I can definitely recommend the food there but the particular place that I thought might be of interest and goodness only knows how you pronounce this Genel Gassil something like that anyway the place with the unpronounceable name is absolutely fascinating because it's absolutely chock-a-block with sculptures that the locals have done so this little mountain village, it absolutely is in the middle of nowhere. You drive round all these winding mountain roads thinking who on earth would live out here? You just completely and utterly isolated. And what they found was that a lot of the young people, because there was just no work, they was just this mass exodus and they were worried that it was going to become an abandoned village. So the mayor had the bright idea of inviting in a whole load of um, artists from around Spain and basically giving them um, free houses to live in I think and on the proviso that they taught the locals how to make art and this is the end result now a lot of the artists ended up them and their families living in Genel Garcil and to this day every single street and every single wall virtually has some form of art on it now I was told by a friend that they get a discount in their taxes if they have art on display for the public now I don't know if that's true or not but you know they've not just shoved up any old piece of art people had really tried hard and put a lot of effort into the pieces they produced and a lot of love you can really see the the whole of the little village has got involved in this project and often use materials that they just had to hand and some of them are quite humorous as you'll see and I must admit I didn't see anybody who looked like this when I wandered around the village so I'm not quite sure where he got his inspiration from and the views overlook um, the sort of Gibraltar area and then on to North Africa and a bit of an interesting sculpture here, their take on immigration. Now in the first two weeks of August every year they celebrate and have a festival of all the art and artists from all over the world come to visit so if you're around them well good time to visit. Now I was also told about a place called Huska, at least I think that's how you pronounce it up here, because apparently they filmed the Smurf movie there and they painted the entire town, every single house, they painted blue, Smurf blue. And I just couldn't imagine what that was going to look like. So I thought, right, I'm going to have to go and investigate this. Just sheer curiosity. Either that or the inner five-year-old was going, oh, Smurf Village, got to go see that. But anyway, if you are going to check it out and it's a great place to take the kids, um, I would be very careful if putting in your sat-nav from the sculpture place with the unpronounceable name through to Huskar because mine decided it would like quite like to kill me and took me off piece so to speak so this road as you can see is is bad enough 
that snakes all the way up here. But um, Sat Nav decided to take me through the mountain roads and I was absolutely sure I was going to die. And here's a couple of photographs of that lovely mountain road. Now this was at the safe point when there wasn't sheer drops either side and the road was very narrow and I'd stopped hyperventilating and silently screaming. And once my morbid curiosity had been satisfied, to be honest, I'm not sure it was worth risking life and limb on that mountain road to go and see a few Smurfs. But anyway, the next stop was the beautiful lakes near El Choro. And that is a wonderful gorge where they've got this um, walk that the workers used to use. And they've uh, recently repaired this rather treacherous path and they've opened it up to the public. So it was too hot to do this in June, but I do hope to do it next year. And there's a fabulous fabulous hotel and restaurant La Garganta nearby and definitely recommend eating there though I haven't stayed there yet. So as you can see there's so much more to um, Spain than just the beaches so I hope that's inspired you to do some traveling there yourself. You never know maybe the Spanish tourist board will give me a job. Now the garden design show is taking a break over August, but when we come back in September, this is one of the gardens we're gonna feature. Little bit of a slope and levels issue to sort out. So stay tuned to the next episode to see how we resolved it. And also in the next episode, we'll be catching up with Nikki and Matt's garden. You may remember we featured this in episode 15. We were actually hoping to bring it to you in this episode, but unfortunately they've got held up with builders and rain delays and all sorts. So with a bit of luck, we'll be able to bring you the full guided tour of how it finally turned out in our next episode. So from everyone here at Successful Garden Design, we really hope you've enjoyed the show. And do let us know what you'd like featured in future episodes. And do please leave us a review on either iTunes or YouTube. It would mean the world to us. Many thanks. Until next time.